once again, McClellan had failed to deliver the offensive strike that Lincoln was looking for. McClellan himself blamed the failure on delays by Lincoln and Halleck in providing reinforcements, but Lincoln was convinced, now, that McClellan was not the man he needed to lead the Union attack. On June 26, 1862, President Lincoln reorganized the Union forces, creating the Army of Virginia, not to be confused with Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Lincoln gave the command to Major General John Pope, who had recently been highly successful in the Western theater of operations. Lincoln's orders to the Army of Virginia were for it to protect the capital, but also, in the speediest manner, attack and overcome the rebel forces. In other words, Lincoln wanted action. Pope issued a number of orders that indicated that he would take a harder approach against the rebels than McClellan would have considered. His general order number five directed that his troops be subsisted on the country in which their operations are conducted. In other words, the soldiers should take what they needed, food, supplies, horses, mules, from the citizens of rebel states, a harbinger of things to come under General Sheridan and Sherman in 1864. In mid-July, Pope led a force into Culpeper Courthouse. By the end of the month, Pope had over 40,000 men occupying the village. Lee, ever the aggressive fighter, was confident that McClellan would not attack, though he was still camped near Richmond. Lee sent Stonewall Jackson with General A.P. Hill's division to head off Pope in Gordonsville. On August 9th, Union and Confederate forces clashed at the base of Cedar Mountain, eight miles south of Culpeper. Pope's forces were moving south towards Gordonsville. Jackson hoped to strike at the lead elements under General Banks and defeat them before they could merge again with the rest of the Union force. Jackson was surprised by the force of the attack by Banks' troops, and initially the Confederate general and his men were pushed back. But Jackson was able to rally his men especially the famous Stonewall Brigade, and they were able to drive the Union forces from the field. Jackson was unable to shatter Banks' corps, but the very presence of Jackson's troops made the Union nervous. Having once again been given the initiative, Robert E. Lee would not waste it. Lee needed to smash Pope's army before it was joined by the Army of the Potomac. And on August 25th, Lee sent Jackson on a wide movement around Pope's west flank to strike in the rear of Pope's forces. Jackson's infantry was referred to as foot cavalry, for they moved faster on foot than most believed possible. Jackson used his knowledge of the terrain to find unexpected routes to and around the enemy, and he had the ability to inspire his men to endure long, hard marches. Confederate Major General W.B. Tolliver describes Stonewall Jackson's raid around Pope. Stonewall Jackson with Ewell's and A.P. Hill's divisions and his old division under my command marched northward to cut Pope's communications and destroy his supplies. Quartermasters and commissaries were left behind. Three days meager rations had been cooked and stowed away in our haversacks and pockets and tin cans and an occasional frying pan constituted the entire camp equipage. Jackson kept their destination known only to a few to ensure secrecy. This extreme reticence was very uncomfortable and annoying to his subordinate commanders and was sometimes carried too far, but it was the real secret of the reputation for ubiquity which had, he had acquired and which was so well expressed by General McClellan in one of his dispatches. I am afraid of Jackson. He will turn up where least expected. Jackson marched his resupplied men through the night toward the field where the South had earned its first great victory, Manassas, near Bull Run Creek. The Battle of Second Manassas, or Second Bull Run, began on August 28th near the Brawner family farm. After their long night march, Jackson and most of his men were catching a few precious moments of sleep. Then, 
a captured Union message was brought to Jackson, indicating that Pope intended to concentrate his forces at Manassas Junction. Tolliver writes, The captured dispatch aroused Jackson like an electric shock. He was essentially a man of action. He rarely, if ever, hesitated. He never asked advice. He did not seem to reflect or reason out of purpose, but he leapt by instinct to a conclusion and then as rapidly undertook its execution. In this fight, there was no maneuvering and very little tactics. It was a question of endurance, and both endured. Jackson did not achieve a decisive victory with both sides taking heavy casualties, but he did succeed in getting General Pope's attention. Pope had been looking for Jackson fearful of where and when he might crop up. And now he'd found him. But he misread the situation. He believed that Jackson had been in retreat when the forces clashed. Pope knew that Longstreet was coming to reinforce Jackson, but he thought that now he had caught Jackson before those reinforcements could arrive. The next day, August 29th, Pope threw his forces at Jackson who had entrenched along an unfinished railroad grade. Pope had the numerically superior force, but Jackson's defenses were strong. Again, casualties were high, but the Confederates pushed the Union forces back time and time again. Around noon on that day, Longstreet's force arrived, marching out of Thoroughfare Gap to take position on Jackson's right. Pope ordered Major General Fitz John Porter to attack, but Porter, seeing that he would be overwhelmed by Longstreet's force, held firm. The next day, August 30th, Pope again ordered Porter's V Corps to attack. He seemed oblivious to the fact that Longstreet's arrival eliminated the Union's advantage in men. Pope didn't realize it, but he was playing into Robert E. Lee's hands. Pope kept expecting the Confederates to retreat, but Lee was hoping to be attacked. Confederate artillery tore apart the attack by Porter's V Corps, and then Longstreet's 25,000 infantry crushed the Union left flank. It was not the rout of 1st Manassas, with terrified Union troops fleeing the field in complete disorder, but it was another embarrassing Union defeat. Pope was removed by Abraham Lincoln and sent back west on September 16th. Faced with his broken and disorganized army, Lincoln now turned, no doubt reluctantly, to the man who had rebuilt the Army of the Potomac after the first loss at Bull Run, General George McClellan. McClellan would get one more chance to create a highly trained professional army and prove that he could then lead the army to victory against the Confederacy's greatest general. For in the wake of another stunning victory at Manassas, Virginia, Robert E. Lee was turning north. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.